It's only fun when you win. Well, why don't we why don't we start? Um, Gary's going to be the Gary and and Dave Dave Decker um, are going to be the basically the show tonight. Um, uh, Gary and, Gary will be the show. <laughs> I, I I will be the straight guy. <laughs> okay. What, what'd you do to your head? <laughs> I, I had a little battle with my motorhome. I'm doing oh. uh, plumbing uh, underneath it and. Uh, Actually, I think, uh, Dave, you were here when I was working on that at one point. Yeah. I finished the job finally, but uh, crawling inside of those cabinets under the motorhome is a mess. Yeah. But guess what? Whammo. Yeah. <laughs> Winnebago won. <Dave>. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a Band-Aid on my arm yesterday. Uh, but that was because I got my second shot. So. Ah. That was really good. So, okay, well, why don't we start? Um, and I'll share my screen. I've just got one slide, which uh, I thought I'd share. Uh, I've been signed out again. No, you haven't. I'm yep. still in? You're yep. okay. okay. You're still in, you're still the host. All right, do you see my slide? We do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it says February, March, April. So Gary's going to handle tonight's meeting. Uh, next in March, I think uh, Stu Foreman's going to give us a, a lesson in PIX Insight. Um, I have talked to Greg Kinklaw, and he's agreed to do uh, Sky Tools in, in April. Um, and uh, Jerry Hilburn is is one of the uh, one of the old time uh, SDA members, and, and he tells me that he he is the one that started the first ASIC group, and that was back in another century. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, Jerry's thing has has always been asteroids, or for a long time it's been asteroids, and I thought that that would be something, what he does with asteroids, how he tracks them and how, how he uh, pictures them. And, uh, and I think he's actually thinking of, we're going to take some pictures with Tarot of asteroids. So uh, he's going to, he's going to, I think he's going to talk in May. It may be that when you get out to May, June, July, it's not clear. Uh, um, the, the things may move around a little bit. Um, and then I wanted to do uh, a session where uh, Dave Wood uh, provides us with a high quality tarot image and the whole group processes it to see, you know, the different ways and, and uh, how, how, the, how the different processing turns out. And uh, perhaps in July, we can do what we did last year, which it has, it has the group doing a, uh, an image, one specific image, and processing it and, and, and showing to see how that turns out. And August, September, October, November, November, we've got open. Well, in fact, the, if anybody has any comments or changes or, or additions, uh, let me know. But I'm, you know, so I'm still working on the schedule for the rest of the year. How about and, another project where we, as a group, collect a, a target? And process it. That's Which July last year. That's July. Oh, look, okay. That's where we actually go collect an image and process. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. Good. Right. That is exactly what I intended. I thought it worked really good last year, so yes. I want to do it again. Mr. Meeting Host, are you watching your waiting room? Uh, I was. Oh. <laughs> well, in fact, I'm. Him. Can you get him? Because I got him. Yeah. I am uh, with this share. My my controls. Just if you if you go yeah. to part test if you go to yeah, participants. I did. I did. I had lost it, but I've got it back. Yeah, and thank you, Dave, why? for uh, letting them in. <laughs> so, so let me. It start was fun. This. It was it was it was. This was fun with a hundred members on board. I'll bet. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah, and I. Uh, I think I did a better job of letting people in for, for the <laughs> banquet, but uh, I, I uh, 
I get sidetracked pretty easy. So thanks for letting them in. How many are we up to? 18, I guess. That's yeah, we got, all, we got 18 going on here. Yeah, right. So uh, with that, I think I'd like to turn it over to to uh, Gary and, and let him tell us about EAA. And, and Dave's going to chime in a little bit too, right? Yep. Yep. So I will, I will stop share. And okay. I'm going to do my screen share and then hopefully we will be. Okay. You need to allow me to screen share. Yeah. Right. So there you go. Uh, let me see if, if you're allowed. <clears throat> All participants. Yeah. You should be able to share. Okay. And, uh, Right. If, so if there's any time left over and anybody has the things you want to talk about, uh, we'll do that after after Gary. But Gary's the main event for tonight. Yeah, okay, great. Um, okay, I just need to try and... Okay, you should see the share now, right? Yep. Yep, looks good. Okay, okay it's good now. Right. Okay, great. Uh, well, um, firstly, thank you for having myself and Dave along this evening to present. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll do an interesting talk for you. Um, we've got a combination of actual um, us talking and uh, some embedded videos. Um, I was actually going to try and remote control my telescope as well, but since I didn't really want to play whack-a-mole in front of the group, I decided that wasn't probably a good idea. So uh, we've got uh, some videos that will um, show everything that we could have live demonstrated. And um, really, the, the aim of the talk this evening is to look at astrophotography as a sort of stepping stone into EAA, so electronically assisted astronomy, and also photometry, which is kind of my current interest. And I will be presenting with Dave. Um, and you all know Dave. Uh, Dave's got a few slides uh, at the beginning of the presentation that will sort of paint the picture of partially why we're here in front of you this evening, apart from just the general interest side of it. And I am going to try and get my, there it goes. Um, so uh, we've got quite a lot to go through this evening. So if you get bored at any point, let me know. Uh, I can kind of break this. I can stop midway if you want me to. If you want to go all the way through it, uh, there's some really interesting stuff on photometry. And I would like to uh, discuss the, um, the exoplanet watch at the end of this, which is something I'm kind of involved with. So we're going to look at EAA. Uh, we're going to consider why, um, if you're an astro guy, you might uh, want to be interested in EAA as an extension of what you're already doing. Um, as you'll see, EAA is primarily used or is one of the a big tool for public outreach. Um, so we're going to discuss that. I'm going to look at my equipment setup, uh, how I go through processing EAA and it, um, EAA images to provide a real-time live stream. I'm going to show you a real-time live stream or at least a video of a real-time live stream show you what can be achieved. Um, and then I'm going to discuss photometry, which is an area that I've started to get into pretty heavily. And it was kind of really uh, good to find out that I didn't really need to change a lot, um, which is good. Um, and um, I've got a sample processing session from that. And as I mentioned, I'm going to finish off a few words on Exoplanet Watch. If you guys have got any questions, please unmute yourself. Um, I'm not sure how the chat window is going to come up. so. Uh, you can try that, uh, and if somebody sees a chat and I, I'm not responding to it, please just give me a call out. And uh, my apologies for not making kind of quite eye contact with the uh, video. It's slightly above me, so it's kind of pointing down. Anyway, uh, EAA, uh, what is it? Uh, so it stands for Electronically Assisted Astronomy, and according to the Cloud Unites Forum, it's the use of an analog or digital capture device uh, in lieu of an eyepiece to provide uh, near real-time imaging of the targets. And they're essentially DSOs. Although you can, you can do planets, you can obviously do the moon, um, but it's really best set up for uh, deep sky objects. Um, 
basically there's no post processing allowed at all. Um, so everything has to come out of the um, capture software and be either displayed to you or streamed to the internet. Uh, you're not allowed to do anything beyond that. Um, EAA has got its roots in analog video devices, as I'm sure some of you know, and I know that some of some of the people here, I believe, have uh, still using the Revolution 2 or, or Millicam type products of, of that type. Um, but really now it's kind of evolved into um, CMOS and it's CMOS sensors that um, dominate um, the cameras used in EAA. And it is surprisingly a contentious topic. If uh, if you want to get uh, into an argument on cloudy nights, um, just post your thoughts on the Revolution Imager or CMOS and say one's better than the other or suggest that they might do real time solar imaging and you'll get an argument going straight away. It's, uh, it's still a surprisingly contentious uh, aspect of the hobby. Um, Anyway, I guess that's what it is. Um, and uh, the moderators are quick to jump on comments like that and, uh, and sort them out. OK, so why do EAA as an astro guy? A um, couple of reasons, really. Um, one, um, it is a great way of doing public outreach. And Dave and I, and, and I'll leave Dave to talk more about the outreach part of this in a couple of seconds. Um, but we've been using EAA as our sort of primary method for SDAA public outreach uh, since the pandemic hit and we were unable to go forward with face-to-face -face, uh, public outreach events, which was obviously the way we were doing it before. But I'll let Dave discuss that a little bit further. Uh, secondly, it's a really good way of getting uh, near real-time images of some quality in uh, light polluted skies. So it really does uh, suit people that are living in the city or close to, in the suburban areas. It's a great way of actually being able to use your telescope without driving out to a dark sky site to, to um, enjoy visual astronomy or, or alike. Um, and um, I'm in a Bortle 8 environment here and so all the images you'll see here um, were taken uh, basically from my home um, and, and you can obviously see what the capabilities of an EAA system are. I think the other thing that, yeah, you know, uh, makes it really easy for, for uh, Astro guys is that one, you've got all the equipment. In fact, you can probably dumb down your equipment that you're using in order to do EAA. Uh, most people, for instance, don't use um, guiding uh, while they're doing EAA, so you don't have the extra complication of a guide scope and PhD2 and stuff like that. And the other thing is that you are all very used to dealing with complicated hardware and set, uh, software setups. And there is a lot of um, particularly software uh, that needs to um, be glued together to make EAA work. So, and I think finally, and why I put it in the, in the corner there was your club needs you. Um, Dave and I at the moment are the primary people that are leading the charge on the online um, outreach events and we could really do with a few extra people to uh, come on board, be part of that team for a while and, and get us through the rest of this pandemic um, and, and keeping eyeballs on what the club's doing. So Dave, um, I'll hand it over to you and uh, I'll let you uh, chat about public outreach. Hey, uh, welcome everybody, and i um, glad to see the nice crowd here. Uh, so the answer to the question, why do public outreach for the SDAA? Uh, if you looked carefully at that slide that Gary had up just before this one, uh, you saw Gary uh, at, uh, at his computer, and next to him was uh, Joy. Joy is uh, his daughter. And uh, she truly is a joy. She hangs out quite a bit uh, watching all the things that are happening. And uh, she's indicative of why we do this. Uh, in this picture here, uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, Dave Wiggum. Uh, he's, the, he's the guy with the hat here that's sharing his telescope with a couple of young astronomers. Um, he's been a great supporter of 
standard visual public outreach for many, many years. Um, and my guess is he's probably been a club member longer than most of us. You just don't know him. Uh, lots of history there, but this isn't about him. It's about what he's doing. And what he's doing is he's sharing the sky with these two young astronomers um, that are eager to come out, take a look at a telescope, learn how to point it, how to focus it. They wanna find out what they can actually see. Um, they have so many questions. And uh, to me, uh, I can answer the question for myself. These are the kids, these are the reasons that uh, I, want, I want to continue doing public outreach. Um, th these these uh, young kids are really hungry uh, for experiences that, that they've heard about, they've seen videos about, um, you know, they've seen all these things. Can I see what the Hubble Space Telescope photos uh, are showing us and why not and what can I see? Uh, those are the, uh, the things that they're asking. And uh, these kids are truly our future. You know, uh, as astronomers, uh, <clears throat> I'm a fairly, uh, uh, over the hill guy here trying to trying to keep up with a lot of young people. And uh, I always hope to see young people get into the association, get involved in what we're doing. And this is how we do it. We do it hopefully before they're about 12 or 13 years old, because after that we lose them for a couple of years. So this is a great time to, to reach these kids, get them involved and get them uh, active in doing things. Uh, so next slide there, Gary. So these kids want to know some of the things that, uh, uh, so many things that they, they've asked us when we have been out with the kids in their schools. Uh, they want to know about, uh, they, they don't know the term necessarily, spaceship earth, but they're saying the same thing. What, what is this earth? Why are we uh, so concerned about it? Where are we? Is there another one? Uh, you know, uh, where do we fit in this, in this huge big sky that we're, you know, we're looking at here? And you know the SDA has always been there to answer those questions. Uh, it's one of our objectives uh, stated in our 501c3 filings as an educational nonprofit. And uh, this is how we do it. We, we meet the public, we meet kids, we meet students, we meet um, all kinds of people of all ages. And uh, until, uh, you know, last, until this year, we were doing it in person at places, you know, locations all over San Diego or all over the, the US. So, um, you know, it's our purpose, I think, to provide good answers for these people, uh, the young people, the elderly people, anyone else who shows up uh, to give them good answers and teach them how to explore, uh, you know, this, this universe. Uh, go ahead, slide. <clears throat> so I, I, I mentioned, I, I really didn't want to go down this road too much, but I just briefly, in 2019, before COVID, uh, we finished approximately 120 face-to-face -face regular star party events. And during that year, we had personal contact with over 13,000 attendees. And that's what this club has been doing for many years. Uh, this kind of, of quality contact with the public, sharing what we know and what we have. In 2020, uh, with the COVID situation, everything collapsed. And after two or three star parties that we completed in January, uh, we canceled everything. So it was probably about midsummer, I think, uh, after fretting about this for some time, uh, Gary contacted me and, and we began to discuss the possibility of doing um, live streams. And um, we got going on this thing. And since then, uh, I think it, as of the first of the year, we completed maybe five online events for the, for the club. And uh, in those five online events, we uh, scored probably 70,000 views on YouTube. And I, I thought it was a mistake. It would just blew my mind uh, that this kind of volume of, of uh, contact is possible from uh, a very low key operation like we were running, but uh, there it was. So EAA and the sharing of, of uh, these images on live streams, such as YouTube, Facebook, or whatever we're using, uh, was really the only thing we had available for outreach. And I wholly endorsed uh, Gary's options to, to go forward. And, and we have been doing quite a bit of work together. And I continue to uh, support this idea uh, as we go down the line. If you 
were at the banquet, um, you knew that uh, I mentioned that we were firmly, we were going to go forward and that we expected that we would eventually have our in-person regular outreach program back, but that because we've had these successes, uh, there's no uh, justification for uh, slowing down the support of live streaming as a, as a form of reaching out to the community. So I can't imagine how much success we can have when we have both kinds of, of outreach operations going, uh, both the high check live streaming to extend our, the reach into the community and the personal contacts for you know, kids on campus uh, or parks and so forth. Now, I agree that um, it's true that viewers on uh, a YouTube channel, those 70,000 viewers, are not the same as a personal contact with an attendee at an event. So it's a totally different kind of a thing. But certainly uh, out of a large number of views on YouTube, if we make those uh, programs interesting enough, uh, I think that we'll have a pretty good bottom line effect on our outreach program. So you couple that with the in-person programs that we've had in the past. And I think that the, uh, the sky's the limit for you know, uh, outreach with San Diego. So it will uh, continue to be a part of our outreach program. And uh, I really thank Gary for dragging me along, teaching me some of the ropes. Um, as uh, in, when you get into the mid seventies, it's a little more difficult to uh, adapt to uh, the virtual concepts that you know, most of our society is pretty, pretty adept at. So thank you, Gary. And um, I don't, I think that's my last slide. I, I think I can turn it back over to you. Oh, I did want to, oh yes, thank you very much. I did want to uh, give kudos to a few people that have been doing uh, live viewing and stacking techniques for SDA outreach in the past. Uh, Neil Kelly, uh, I think you probably all know him, very sophisticated live stacking programs and methods. Uh, Larry Marshall has had a simple live video, but he's just great with it and great with the kids, easy to set up and he knows how to, how to make a story out of that. Uh, Woody Schlamm, uh, I'm not sure if he's on this, this meeting, but he's the Madeline Cam guy. He's the old school video guy, a professional, and he has so many uh, great ideas and, and ways of uh, doing things. Um, and so uh, Woody is part of our conversation all along here. Um, and as those, those of you that don't know him, uh, Vivek, I won't try to butcher his last name. Um, Vivek is a young student. And um, he's an incredibly smart guy. Uh, a lot of you may already know him from your contact. Uh, he's been a winner in the San Diego Greater Science Fair uh, program for a number of years. He's quite a, an expert now in spectroscopy. And uh, he's been actually been doing his own um, live events online. So uh, thank you folks. And for those of you that, have, that I didn't mention, uh, there are many others that have been using uh, some of the older uh, concepts, mounting cams and so forth to do live viewing. And uh, that's, that's a great history. Uh, we do have a lot of professional observatories out there that are doing some pretty good stuff, uh, Lowell and McDonald, um, but they have high budgets. They have a full staff of people, they have production crews, they have video crews and uh, yes, it's good, but it's not like what we do here. Uh, we're much more down home, simple. And um, I think Gary already mentioned it once tonight. Uh, like Gary says, uh, our programs have been like two men and a duck playing whack-a-mole. And uh, it, it is exactly that. And I think you'll probably see uh, some examples of that in the videos that are coming up. So, but we are acquiring new skills, um, a few new facilities when we need to. Uh, we don't have a crew, but we're still reaching thousands. And it just amazes me that there are that many people jumping onto YouTube and joining in uh, with what we're doing. So come join us. Uh, any part of this program that you're interested in, whether it's the, um, the imaging, the uh, production, the live stream, the support, the research and the, and doing some of the, uh, uh, I don't know, some of our program concepts, uh, come join us. We would love to have you, Gary.
mic. Try the mic, Gary. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> Here we go again. Uh, so I was just saying thanks for that, uh, Dave. And uh, yeah, outreach is my primary interest. That's why I joined the club. And uh, uh, to be able to now take it online uh, is uh, is proving to be very beneficial during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So this is uh, my EAA setup. It's pretty straightforward. It's based around a Celestron uh, C8 uh, SCT, uh, quite an old one actually. Um, and uh, behind that, I have a uh, 0.63 focal reducer to give me a slightly wider field of view and to make the uh, the SCT a little faster, um, which you need for EAA since uh, we're, we're invariably not using um, guiding. Um, I have a nine megapixel uh, 553MC CWO camera. That's my main uh, camera for uh, use. Uh, it could be any one of a number of cameras, but this one's uh, quite interesting. It's kind of unusual. It has a square format, uh, which is a little unusual. Um, and often there is a, a CCD CLS uh, filter, uh, in my case, an Optolong filter uh, that sits in the optical jet chain just to help knock down some of the light pollution. You don't need a particularly expensive mount. You can use a a basic ASL mount. Um, I was using an AVX mount for quite some time, but I've recently upgraded to an EQ6R. Um, it gives me a little bit more weight carrying capacity and actually it's been a, a huge benefit as I've moved into uh, longer images for photometry. Um, and uh, I find the Telrad an absolutely invaluable uh, tool for allowing me to do manual alignment uh, on initial stars for focusing and stuff like that. Uh, the one thing that I don't have an arrow on is the guider. Uh, I do actually have a guider that I made and use uh, most of my EAA live streams now, but it's I'm I'm kind of a little unusual in that respect. And some of the purest EAA guys have already pointed out that they don't really like guiding. Um, but why that would make a difference, I have no idea. Uh, since it's there and it's easy to use, I figure it's better to keep the telescope pointed more accurately at my target. Um, but anyway, um, so that's my EAA uh, setup. Um, that's all of the hardware listed on the left hand side. And then in terms of software, I use uh, SharpCat Pro that I'm sure many of you have heard of. That is a live stacking program. It's kind of the de facto standard for uh, Windows based EAA systems. Um, you can use one of a number of uh, star maps. I happen to use Cart to Seal. Um, for my guider, I use PhD2, uh, EQMod, EQTOR Tor are um, open source drivers, mount drivers for the uh, Skywatcher mount. Obviously, ASCOM drivers are needed. Um, and this is a great tool for those of you who've not used it and you need to do either a lot of plate solving or a lot of image processing. It's, it's good at pipelining. Uh, ASTAP uh, is a tool that I use a lot and I use it a lot in photometry as well. So uh, if you haven't heard of that tool, it's worth taking a look. It is a really fast plate solver. This thing will plate solve in about half a second, uh, which is perfect for doing AAA sessions where you wanna get onto a target, do five or six minutes of imaging and move on to the next target. Um, and then uh, in terms of streaming software, there's a number of different ways to go, but I happen to use another open source program called uh, OBS Studio. Um, my setup has an effective focal length of about, um, about 1300 millimeters. I've actually just changed it again, so I've got a slightly wider field of view, uh, about half a degree uh, square. And I usually uh, do subs between about 8 and 60 seconds, uh, depending on whether the guider is on or off. And that's kind of my ecosystem of software uh, that sort of all hangs together. And I guess if you wanted to add another piece of software on top of that, I also have the ability to remote control my mount from indoors. So I use a program called TeamViewer for that. Uh, I know a number of people use uh, remote uh, uh, window, oh, what is it? Remote desktop, Windows desktop or whatever the 
the Windows one is, which is is well known. Unfortunately, I don't have Windows 10 Pro running all, on all my machines, so I use uh, TeamViewer instead. But that's the ecosystem of software. And as you can see, it's quite an extensive ecosystem of software. There's a lot of stuff that needs to hang together. So software expertise and being comfortable is kind of a, a useful skill. I kind of mentioned the live stacking already. It's and and you guys are uh, obviously very familiar with this um, with this type of workflow, where we're taking darks and flats to calibrate an incoming image that we've captured. We're stacking that software, and we're then applying some processing to it in order to um, get our final image. Now, of course, if you if you're doing astrophotography. A lot of this is done in post. If you are doing, um, if you are doing AAA, this is all done on the fly and all done within SharpCap. And I actually use the pro version of uh, SharpCap. Um, it's got a number of enhancements in it, which I find particularly useful. Um, and SharpCap is the other reason I like SharpCap is Robin Glover is an extremely um, let's say diligent developer. Uh, he's constantly improving the platform. And in fact, this slide is now out of date and I only put the slide together two weeks ago. The beta version is now at 4.0 um, and uh, the beta version includes um, most recently the, the latest addition to it was a sequencer, which provides uh, SGP like functionality. And that's been a real improvement in SharpCap um, and uh, the release for beta version, which I'm now part of the guys testing it, I guess. Um, uh, that's got some pretty major additions to the sequencer. Uh, the free version is powerful, but the paid version, which is 15 bucks a year, contains so many more features, it's definitely worth shelling out the $15. You've got a sequencer, you've got a whole number of um, smart focusing tools, you've got a smart histogram tool, and it's got a very cool polar alignment tool as well. So I don't have anything, um, uh, I do all my polar alignment in software, I don't have any hardware products that support that. Okay, so now we are going to see an EAA live stream, which allows me to stop talking for a minute and it gives you an idea of how we would go through an e the sort of EAA process here. And I'm hoping that the volume is going to come through from my system. So if somebody can give me a thumbs up that they're getting the volume and I click the play button, that would be great. Do you hear this guys? Uh, I, I don't think we're hearing it. I no. think if you pull down your uh, controls in the top middle, there's a uh, allow computer sound or something. Right. Like. So, um, so Gary, unstop, yeah. stop sharing. Yep. Hit share screen again. Yep. Lower left hand corner is share audio, computer audio, and optimize for video stream. See okay. Those? Got it. Tap, tap those two guys and try it again. Okay. Cool. Are we good now? We still have to share the screen. Share the screen. All right, hold on. Uh, all right, just bear with me a second, guys. I'm uh, one of the things that I'm not so familiar with. Uh, there we go. Uh, one of the things I'm not so familiar with is um, is Zoom, surprisingly enough. Um, so I just need to find out where I share my script. I've lost my screen share. Where's that button gone? Um, hold on. At, at the bottom in the middle. Got it. I got it. Okay. So I got to pick the right one. Okay. Let's try that. Oh, damn. Hold on. The, it deselected itself again. Uh, it's what I say about whack-a-mole, right? I mean, that was exactly what I was saying earlier here, right? Um, and of course, now I'm all fingers and thumbs. Um, hold on, right. Okay, Gary, deep breath. Oh, I've lost. Okay, right. Screen share. Click that. Click that. Do that. Do that. There you 
We've I got should. it now. We've got your screen. All right, good. So now, there we go. So now I just need to go into there, and now I need to click that. So uh, we are now going to move to NGC. Are we good? Eight, nine, We're good. One. We have sound. We have Perfect. sound, yes. Uh, Dave will be doing the translation to the Caldwell catalog. Um, unfortunately, my observing list only gives me one of the two names that I have, and it's giving me the NGC number all the time. And this is a really nice a target. So um, let's um, let's not describe it, Dave, I think, until we get our first couple of images come okay, up. Okay, Because sure. it is a really pretty target, sure. this one. So um, I'm going to go back into, um, I'm going to go back into sharp cap. I am going to do a plate solve to make sure that I am in the right place and this uh this target was actually in the uh february observing challenge on cloudy night because it is just such a beautiful uh target um i'm going to clear my stack and hopefully we will see our first image pop up in um i think i've got my sub length currently set for about 13 and a half seconds Okay, yes, fantastic. I'm going to clear the stack again because I can, as you can see, the um, the uh, the mount hadn't quite settled. You could see the streaking on the uh, stars there. Um, so I am, um, but it's got it the second time, and this is a fabulous target. Um, as you will see in a few moments, I will actually um, zoom in. And you can see this already beginning to form. So, Dave, um, I think they know what we're looking at. So uh, let's go with a little bit of the detail. This is Caldwell 23. Caldwell 23. Um, so we can it's, it's up on the screen, right? Yes. OK, yep. so mm -hmm. um, this is a fantastic uh, edge on galaxy and uh, uh, it's it's uh, so sort of northwest in Andromeda. It's very close to the star of Almach, which is a, a great double star uh, target and popular in uh, outreach programs. Um, so uh, 23 is a it's an edge on galaxy. Uh, it's about 13 minutes by three minutes in size. Does that sound about right, Gary? uh 13 minutes by three minutes uh, let me yeah. just zoom back out there okay. quickly yeah that would be about right mm -hmm. so the yeah. the length of this galaxy is probably uh maybe almost half the size of the full moon across uh yes. in in mm -hmm. diameter and uh so it's it's fairly large in the sky um it has a nice history um uh, there's lots of good stuff about this galaxy in uh, Robert Burnham's uh, uh, books. Uh, we know that uh, I think Robert Burnham actually referred to a sketch that was done by Lord Rossi and uh, that showed the dark lane across the center of the galaxy. And uh, I am uh, looking at, uh, I'm a little bit behind uh, Gary, I'm looking at the view, but it looks pretty darn good to me. Yes, we got a really, yes. and I've just zoomed back in again. I, yeah. I zoomed back out when you'd asked me to check against the field of view, and you can really see the dark lane uh, going through the uh, center of the galaxy. And, and it actually, and you'll see it begin to form um, image-wise a little better with time here, but it extends from just past this star here all the way across to about here so we're kind of this this part out here is a little bit fuzzy um, we can certainly see the core and the bump of the core and the very distinct uh, dark lane going through the center of it we are then going to move on to uh, probably the most famous uh, nebula uh, in the um, Orion constellation, and that is the Orion Nebula itself. And because this is just such a bright nebula, I'm actually going to bring, I'm actually going to clear that stack again. There we go. Um, I'm actually going to bring my um, sub time down to about 15 seconds because uh, I can collect a lot of data and we can see our first image uh, pretty quickly. Here we go. So, um, yeah, so uh, I will adjust this in a few moments uh, to uh, make this a little cleaner. Um, but before I do that, in fact, let me do that quick adjustment. 
back here as we allow a few images to come in. So the Orion Nebula M42, um, and I'm going to be reading directly from um, Burnham here. This is the great nebula in Orion, considered the finest example of a diffuse nebula in the sky and one of the most wonderfully beautiful objects of the heavens. And in fact, I think um, you can see this is a pretty incredible uh, image that we have formed here, um, probably with only um, we 60 seconds of imaging. Um, and you can already see uh, the core area showing bright white um, and the expanding Orion Nebula. Now, the Orion Nebula is considerably bigger than the um, field of view of my telescope. So we're actually uh, really only seeing um, the first part of it. Uh, if I actually wanted to uh, show this image in its entirety, I would probably have to put a mosaic together. Um, but um, obviously, we're not going to do that this evening. So uh, we are now. OK, great. Well, um, as you hopefully can hear me, and unfortunately, in my ongoing game of whack-a-mole here, um, I have now lost uh, the pictures of you guys down the side. So I'm kind of just talking to my video camera. So Dave, am I good? Hello? Uh, yeah, I had to unmute. Yeah, we can hear uh, you. Yes, you're, you're good. Everything's fine. Uh, yes, there's way up in the far right-hand corner, there's a little video. looks like a, a crown, and you can probably check that and get it, get that back. Uh, you know, I can't even see that, so I'm not even. I'm not going to play with it at the moment. I'll just, <laughs> okay. I'll just talk to the video camera. My, my guess okay. is, my guess is that Gary's running two video monitors, correct? Uh, yes. Yes. The problem is, is that in in Zoom, the participant window usually hides out behind your share screen. Yeah. So I'm beginning to find out. And, and another really annoying thing here is that uh, if I click the video. Um, to play and then hit the mute button. It mutes not only my microphone but the video. So I have yes, to remember. <laughs> I have to remember to hit the mute first and then the play in order for it to work. So uh, yes. we. So having said this is a game of whack-a-mole, uh, let me uh, illustrate just uh, how it can go on certain evenings. So uh, here is uh, video number two. We've just been given a whole bunch of napkins because our computer equipment is disappearing in water here. There's so much uh, humidity in the air. And at the moment, the telescope lens is, uh, is somewhat fogged up. OK, Dave, so I can see your audio is working. I think you just need to be maybe a tiny bit closer to the microphone there. Yes, Gary may well be going back to his home again because uh, not only is it dry over there, I am 30 seconds away from solving technical problems where I could just go and get a cable from the house. This is definitely a challenge tonight and I am so hoping that this hairdryer is going to turn up here. We may just have to do some single shot images to start with and we'll go from there. And um, yes, and we'll go from there. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, right, so um, by way of, oh, we have a hairdryer, so this could, this could uh, get us out of a few problems here, and I'm sure everybody is chuckling away there on the, uh, yes, Lester, I do have a dew shield, uh, but believe me, we are close to 100% humidity here. So Dave is working away with the hairdryer, and I'm hoping that that is probably enough. So I'm going to clear this stack here. I think we're good, Dave. I think so. I'm hoping so. Okay, so <laughs> Kathleen uh, added, this is so dramatic. I'm not sure whether it's dramatic. Uh, it's certainly giving me a little bit of heart failure here. And I can honestly tell you, nothing is working with my mouse. I think I need a beer, guys. Anybody got a stiff drink or a beer? I am going to need a drink very shortly. Actually, if you could dry mount the computer would be really helpful because the computer is just, this is a mess. And I was just saying, one of the error problems that we've encountered this evening was, I usually have a very uh, clever piece of software on here called a plate solver, uh, which allows me to um, point them out in approximately the right direction. 
um, and then do what's called a plate solve, and it works out how far I'm off, and it corrects the mount uh, so that the target appears precisely in the center of the screen. Of course, uh, since uh, <laughs> you know we're having some problems here, uh, the plate solver has decided it doesn't want to play this evening. Is that my target up there, Dave? I'm actually surprised the stream is still going. I mean, I guess we can be thankful for that. Did I see a beer? Yes. Unbelievable! <laughs> a lager has suddenly appeared on my desk here. This is incredible. Suddenly the world appears to be a happier place. Oh, that is so much better. I am feeling a lot happier with the world now. Um, probably so, just... so just to interrupt you there, Dave, one of the comments from Curtis was, I thought you said bear, not beer. And um, <laughs> judging by the way things are going this evening, having a bear or a small mountain lion turn up uh, this evening <laughs> would not be unexpected. So sorry to interrupt you there. Uh... Okay, well, um, as you can see, uh, things uh, do not always go according to plan. And those were just the outtakes from a single event we did at Mount Helix. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty entertaining that evening. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed those few outtakes. OK, let me continue. Um, We've just been given a whole bunch of napkins because our... Try that again. Our... OK, so um, the other thing um, that I'm going to mention just briefly, and I've gotten a quick video on, is the open broadcast software that I use. This is a pretty comprehensive open source uh, video recording and live streaming uh, program. And in fact, even if you're just putting together videos and you've got no plans for live streaming, it does give you a sort of studio type environment in which you can uh, bring together a number of scenes and mix them and do some pretty interesting audio mixing as well. So even if you're doing just like recording to put up on YouTube, uh, I think it's uh, it's kind of Kind of an interesting piece of software. It's, uh, it's got certainly got a rich feature set, and it's capable of broadcasting to uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and uh, a number of other social media platforms. Okay, so I'm going to mute again, and um, I am going to mute again. Whoops, why am I going the wrong way? Um, we. Right, there we go. And I am going to play the next video. So, good evening. Uh, my name is Gary Hawkins from the San Diego Astronomy Association. And this uh, brief tutorial is going to show you how to do basic YouTube live streaming using OBS Studio. And I'm just going to work through uh, all the different things you need to set up in order to establish a basic uh, live stream on YouTube for your audience. If, for instance, you're doing electronically assisted astronomy. So uh, what I'm actually going to be showing you is my screen during this process, my desktop screen, so that you can see the various things that are happening. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a uh, browser. I'm going to go into um, YouTube and I'm going to create the stream for your viewers to view. And in order to do that, you simply need to go across to the create button here, click it and go live. So we've now gone into part of YouTube called YouTube Studio. And this is where we set up our live stream. You can edit the parameters for your live stream here. So if I quickly click on edit here, I can put up my Gary Hawkins OBS tutorial. And I it's a public uh, broadcast. Um, I This broadcast is not specifically made for children. And I can save that. And in order to get OBS to connect to um, YouTube, I need to basically cut and paste 
the appropriate stream key and stream URL. I've already got the stream URL set up in OBS, so I'm going to take my stream, copy my stream key here, and then I'm going to go into the Open Broadcast Software Studio that I'm assuming that you already have set up on your PC. And this version uh, basically is is pretty much as it installed with a few customized settings, and it's those settings that I'm going to go through in a in a little bit of detail as I get this stream going. So in order to start the stream, I need to go into settings. Uh, I need to go into stream. You can see my server already identified in there. I'm going to put in my stream key, which as you remembered, I copied from YouTube. So I'm now going to paste that into OBS. I'm going to apply that, click OK. And I'm going to start my stream by clicking the start stream button. If I now go back to YouTube, I should see in a couple of seconds that I go live as I've done. And you can see the stream starting up now and going out to my audience on YouTube. So that's the stream actually set up. So in order to um, in order to just uh, look at some of the customized settings, I'm going to go back into OBS. And I'm now going to go into the settings tab in OBS and I'm just going to uh, run through those settings um, for you, the ones that I've customized. Um, so basically in the general um, thing, I've customized nothing. Um, we've already looked at the stream tab. Um, you've got your YouTube server and your YouTube stream key. In the output tab, uh, one of the customizations that I've done is I've increased the video bitrate to 2000 kilobits per second. I found that the default of 1500 kilobits per second was a little bit on the low side. In the audio tab, I have the ability to use multiple microphones if you were doing narration with more than uh, one person. Since it's just me this evening, I've just got the one headset selected, uh, my Plantronics uh, headset that I use for these type of broadcasts. On the video uh, setting, which I can't change now uh, because I'm actually in an ongoing stream, and so these are grayed out, um, I am transmitting at 720p. I find uh, this is more than adequate uh, to view on YouTube rather than going out at 1080p, which uses additional processor resources. And I also found that the default frame rate of 60 frames per second, again, used too much in the way of processor resources and was totally unnecessary for the type of live streaming I'm doing. So I've actually taken that back to uh, 30 frames per second. I don't use any hotkeys or any of the advanced functions. And those are basically my setups um, for uh, my uh, YouTube live stream. Um, I can uh, go down and change some settings on my audio mixer if I feel that the audio levels are a little incorrect, um, but they're fine as you can see currently. Um, and that's basically it. That's how to set up a basic stream, a live stream on YouTube using OBS Studio. So I'm actually now going to go across and stop the stream. And if I go into YouTube, you will see that the stream is frozen here now. And I will just end the stream on YouTube. And that stream is now complete. The YouTube video will now be available on YouTube for recap viewing. Um, and uh, obviously you can uh, get a link to share with people that you can you can send out. So that's my stream finished. Just going to go back into OBS and I'm now going to close the OBS package down. Hopefully you have found this. Uh, hopefully you found this uh, video useful this evening and uh, please uh, subscribe to my channel. I do do a number of EAA broadcasts throughout the year, and hopefully at some point you'll be able to uh, join me in one of those. Okay, great. Um, so uh, that was uh, basic 
uh, use of the uh, open broadcast software. Uh, but I will say a few more things about that, assuming I hit the right button here and I go on to my next slide. Ye yes. Um, and let me see if I can just bring up everybody's faces because I'm finding it just a little bit disconcerting now looking at a PowerPoint only slide here with no faces. I mean, you could have all gone home now and I wouldn't know. So um, can somebody tell me how to get the faces back up on the screen, please? Uh, if you go up to view in the upper right hand corner. Uh huh. Maybe uh, you click on that and way yeah, up in the. All right. How to? Um, okay. No, that's not. Actually, I can't see view currently. Um, I have got my map, and I think it's probably associated with the the fact that, um, as uh, somebody said, I've got two uh, screens going here, and unfortunately, I can't even see my second yeah. screen. It's actually behind me. Oh, that's probably so. <clears throat> When you're sharing, Gary, um, do you see do you, do you, <laughs> you're headless now? Okay. Um, so are you running the Mac OS? No, I'm running no Windows. 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 Um, most likely the Windows, I should say the, uh, and you, when you're sharing and you have the participant window open, most of the times I find when that happens and you're on dual monitors, the faces actually end up behind the, uh, uh, behind your sharing window. Okay, so you, I'll, sharing, I'll, you take, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop sharing a second and okay. I'm going to do it that way, I think. So okay. I, I, sorry, so I got the faces back, so that's great. So now I've got to, um, right, so now I'm going to do a screen share again and I'm going to do that. And if I screen share now, oh, rats. Uh, Okay. Anyway, all right. No matter. I'll I'll deal with it. Um, I'll just assume you're all there. Otherwise, I'm going to look like a prize idiot. Uh, anyway, um, there are some more advanced features in OBS that I didn't actually demonstrate in that uh, video. Um, and one of those, which is particularly useful, is a feature called Scenes. This actually allows you to bring multiple sources together under a selected scene. So for instance, I can do a display capture. Uh, I can uh, have a, um, a small window in that, including um, my webcam. I could have some text on the screen um, and I can define that as a scene and I can transition from that scene to another scene that I built up. So you'll see on some of our uh, broadcast, for instance, that Dave and I will appear on the screen. We're talking to each other, and there's a nice border around us, and so forth and so on. Um, so there are some uh, quite advanced features in OBS that actually allow you to put together a fairly sophisticated uh, stream. And in fact, the one we did last week was nice. Uh, we were actually we had we were in a um, in a dark environment. We were doing it outside, and so. Dave's face was illuminated, um, but behind him it was all black and it just sort of merged in nicely with the star scene that we were shooting. Um, and it actually looked really quite professional. So um, there are some nice things you can do with both scenes and transitions. Uh, the other thing that I find particularly useful is uh, I've a virtual audio cable package that allows me to take audio from different applications and bring it into the mixer as separate streams that I can individually control. And again, with the mixing deck, that allows me to do some fairly interesting stuff from the audio side as well. I can bring together Skype, I can bring together the desktop, I can bring together a music player, and I can bring together one or more headsets. Um, and just interestingly enough, um, 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 I made mention of my headset that I use for OBS um, thing. I gave that to my daughter for online school for just one day and my headset is now broken. So I'm actually using a different headset this evening for my standard broadcasting headset. Okay, and going on to the next screen. Okay, so here is an idea of some of the images that you can get 
uh, with EAA. These were all got within uh, probably somewhere between two and 10 minutes. I don't usually spend more than about 10 minutes on a particular object. I'm sure many of these objects are very familiar to you. Um, and in fact, one of them was um, featured in one of the earlier videos. Um, but I think you can see from a um, from a image perspective, it really does allow us to bring um, uh, the night sky um, right to people in a in in a colourful um, and and quite dramatic way. Um, and Obviously, you guys can get better quality um, on these images, but you, you're you typically imaging and doing imaging runs of many hours. Uh, this is collecting only uh, somewhere between about two and 10 minutes of data. Some of the galaxies will take a little longer, uh, but um, globular clusters image really quickly, uh, M42 images really quickly, um, and of course, the moon images in, in milliseconds. And just to bring up, since I mentioned the moon, in addition to the 70,000 uh, viewers that we have got um, on our own YouTube channel, both Dave and I participated in a, a live stream of the penumbral eclipse uh, to uh, time and date. Uh, they're a Norwegian company that, uh, that do um, eclipses on a regular basis and we were two of the three video streams they used uh, throughout the evening um, and they had over 10,000 people online during I think it was 10,000 and they've got over 70,000 people uh, 70,000 views on that particular video as well so that was that was another success that we didn't mention uh, in our earlier uh, slide. And it's kind of interesting. When I asked my daughter, Joy, who is probably the youngest member of SDAA, um, what her favorite picture was, um, she told me it was the moon, um, which kind of surprised me, considering that there are some extremely pretty images up here. Um, a couple of my favorites being the veil and, uh, and the running man. Okay, and um, the other kind of cool thing as well is, um, and I've got a very short video for you here, is that, and I don't think this one has got sound, um, sometimes, and this was actually part of the penumbral eclipse that we did for time and date, sometimes we do actually get to see some unusual stuff. And if you watch this video carefully, uh, you might actually see what I'm talking about. Uh, look down the right hand side of the moon as this video plays, and there it goes. And I'm not sure if you saw that, um, but if you didn't, let me uh, play it again. Oops, I think I missed it myself. There it goes. Let me play it again. And there you go. On the right-hand side, you see this tumbling object, which is just above Tycho at the moment, uh, coming vertically down the screen. Uh, we are still yet to identify what this particular object was. Uh, it did actually go into uh, JPL, um, but they haven't got back to us um, uh, as to what they think it might be. But it was it was kind of interesting, um, and it appeared very briefly on the live stream that we did uh, for time and date. So I'll just finish that video off. There we go. Okay. All right, um, so I think Dave's already kind of touched on some of these things, so I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about the ones that we've already mentioned. I will say that uh, we've managed to triple the YouTube subscriber base uh, in the last six months. Uh, I think we're up close to 500 subscribers now. Um, which is great. Uh, if we can actually get that to a thousand subscribers, um, the club will actually be able to take revenue from the ads that appear uh, at the beginning. Um, and the other, I think, important thing that it's uh, that EA, the online EAA has uh, allowed us to do, it's allowed us to re-engage with some of our local partners, like the county parks, uh, who have been very much um, huge supporters of the club in face-to-face -face, uh, outreach programs. And we've been doing quite a bit of work with um, Oak Oasis recently. Uh, we've been down to Mount Helix and the private organization uh, 503C that runs that. Um, and I'm sure uh, this year we will engage with a number of other entities as well, possibly uh, including the uh, Anzo Borrega uh, Library. 
Um, and it's allowed us to develop some new partnerships. I'm sure this year we will participate in the next upcoming solar eclipse. I think it's solar eclipse, or it may be no, actually it may be a lunar eclipse that's taking place in May. So I think Dave and I will probably get involved in that again. So um, that's kind of the EAA side of it. So before, um, I, so now what I wanted to do was step into the photometry side of it. Um, Scott said that I had anywhere between an hour and two hours. So if you guys get bored or anything, please let me know. But since photometry is my, uh, I wouldn't say key uh, primary interest at the moment, but it's certainly become a very important part of what I'm doing on the astronomy side. Um, I thought I'd uh, mention a few words about that. Um, and, and one reason is really the equipment that I'm using for EAA and the equipment that I'm using for photometry are basically the same thing, which is kind of cool. Um, and I think as well, many of us are looking for ways to expand our interest in the hobby, um, you know, from and, and, and grab some other things you know, participate in some other things in the hobby that we haven't been doing so far. And, and I found that uh, photometry offers that um, capability. So I've recently just uh, completed a course with uh, Pat Boyce at the Boyce Astro Foundation on the measurement of exoplanet transits. And while I haven't done any direct exoplanet um, transit measurements yet using my own equipment. Um, I started to play around with my own equipment to make sure that the capabilities of it were such that it could be used for exoplanet transits. Um, the type of course that Pat does, and obviously if you're a member of the AA, uh, VSO and other entities, there's, there's lots of courses like this. It's been a great way to cement my understandings of a lot of basic astronomical concepts. And this has been fantastic as well because, you know, it improves the way that we can talk to the public during our outreach program. And the other cool thing, as I've already mentioned, is that I actually realized that I had everything at hand that I needed to, um, that I needed for photometry uh, with what I'd already developed with EAA. And, and you can see that I use some pretty unsophisticated hardware. I mean, uh, and I buy, my, buy most of my stuff secondhand. Um, so I've got less than about two grand invested in what I've got to date. And you've seen what it can do EAA wise. And hopefully after about 30 or so minutes, you'll see what it's capable of photometry wise as well, which actually kind of surprised me. Um, for one thing, I hate spending money um, and I'm probably in the wrong hobby uh, for that for that reason. But anyway, um, one of the things that I do try and like to do is uh, during outreach is to demonstrate to people that you don't actually have to spend a lot of money to actually make some fairly good progress uh, in any one of these areas. So exoplanet transits. Um, and what is an exoplanet transit? Well, basically, it's the um, um, the uh, the orbit of a planet around a sun, um, and uh, when that um, when everything is aligned in just the right way, that planet actually passes in front of the um, uh, in front of the uh, sun, as you will see from this animation. And if it does that, and things are aligned in such a way, um, that creates some blockage. Um, of the light that's reaching us here on Earth, and we see a dip in the flux that's being received, and that is essentially an exoplanet transit. And so uh, TESS, uh, which is one of the um, space um, craft that's been up there and has been specifically designed for this purpose, has identified uh, thousands now of potential uh, possibilities for suns with orbiting planets, and um, it's I guess our job to take the test data um, and work on that to further refine our understanding of uh, the type of transits that are taking place. And I'm going to discuss that as a citizen science project at the very end of this, um, at the end of this presentation. So that's an exoplanet transit. Um, but of course, um, exoplanets are not the only thing you can measure with photometry. Um, and um, we can also we also have a huge number of variable stars up there um, of all different classes and types um, and uh, these provide some great targets uh, for doing uh, photometry work and in fact i've been looking at a contact eclipsing variable for the last four weeks called v474 cam 
which is basically a circumpolar um, star of about 11th magnitude um, that I've learned a surprising amount about in the last four weeks. Um, but there are lots of other different uh, types of star, some of which are long period, uh, which perhaps are not um, well suited to uh, particularly the outreach side, but some of them are actually short enough period that you could potentially do um, outreach with them. And uh, our goal, well, my goal this year is to actually do both an eclipsing binary and an exoplanet transit live um, to an audience, uh, either well online and hopefully face to face at the same time. So anyway, we'll see. Um, but there are lots of targets out there in terms of variable stars. And um, I've uh, recently become a member of the AAVSO um, and I have a mentor with them now uh, as well, which is, um, you know, has been a really good experience. And as I said, my equipment that I'm using um, really isn't any different. Um, uh, I may need to make a change to the filter. Um, uh, UVIR cut filter um, is uh, one is is certainly a lot better than using um, the uh, current filter that I'm using for light pollution. I could go down the road of a Sloan or a, a, a Cousins Johnson and Cousins uh, filter set, but I probably won't um, because I think uh, CCD. Um, CMOS cameras now are, are getting to the point where you can actually do a surprising amount of uh, work without the necessity for specialized filters. If you really want to get scientific, then of course you're going to need to go down the specialized filter route. But you know, a set of Sloan filters at two inches is uh, you know it's a three thousand dollar investment. So you've you've got to be pretty serious about what you're doing. Um, and on the software side, um, I found that one of the tools that I was already using, ASTAP, is an extremely good uh, tool for doing pre-processing of data before it goes into the an analysis tool. Um, for an analysis tool, I use two tools, actually. If I'm doing exoplanet transits, I'm using a, a specialized tool called Exotic, which I'll mention again in a few moments. Uh, but if I'm doing general purpose photometry, I use a tool called AIJ um, in combination with Excel. Um, but basically, the rest of the equipment is the same. And I've been very surprised as to just what can be achieved uh, with this relatively modest equipment. So uh, in terms of image capture for the photometry, uh, I'm basically uh, taking uh, unbinned images in a RGGB format um, saved to FITS, uh, 3008 by 3008. Um, I am, one of the biggest things that you need to be aware of when you're capturing images for photometry is not to saturate the target. Uh, star that you're trying to measure and also uh, not saturate the comp stars, uh, which may be a slightly smaller magnitude, so therefore brighter. Um, I found a very useful feature within SharpCap is the highlight overexposure exposure feature that sort of uh, tells you when your um, uh, one of the wells or one of the pixel bins is full um, and you can use this uh, along with perhaps just a simple methodology of saying, you know, let's make sure that um, I ensure that my target star maximum is at least um, is only half the maximum ADU uh, full well depth, for instance, that um, I've got available through my specific camera. Um, and um, to give you an idea of the type of um, gains and exposure times I'm using, uh, if I exposed for around 40 to 60 seconds and obviously with the cat with the OTA setup that I've got I do need to use auto guiding under those circumstances um, I'm using pretty low gains on my um, on my camera only about 105 uh, which is uh, pretty low for the 5 pi 3 MC um, so I've got plenty of uh, capabilities of going down to much fainter stars uh, than 11th magnitude and I can probably do measurements on anything down to about 15th magnitude, I would say. Um, there are a couple of things uh, to avoid doing. Uh, meridian flips in the middle of um, photo uh, photometry runs are not a good ideal um, for a variety of reasons. Um, 
so it's a good idea not to do a meridian flip if possible or to use an OTA uh, or a mount I should say that doesn't require a meridian flip so uh, either a forked mounted um, telescope or an as L mounted scope uh, can work quite well as well. Um, also make sure you've got enough hard drive space. Um, you'd be surprised uh, just how large these FITS files are and if you're collecting three or four hours worth of data once every minute uh, you can start chewing through a lot of hard drive space. And I actually uh, use the streaming software um, that um, uh, my OBS streaming software and I generally stream my uh, image runs up to YouTube so that I can either have a laptop or a tablet uh, with me um, just on YouTube and be inside and just make sure everything is running okay and I can do that if I'm just looking at SharpCap and the PHT2 guiding software. And I actually apply currently my dark flats and biases on the fly through SharpCap but you can do this in post-processing as well with uh, AIJ in uh, the data processing module and you will actually see that taking place in a few moments. So now I'm going to show you one more video. Now this is a significantly longer video. It's about 20 minutes in length so hopefully you won't get too bored um, but it does walk through the entire photometry process once you've collected the images and at the end of this you will actually see um, some output images that I've collected uh, for this particular contact uh, eclipsing binary um, uh, and um, and you'll see what the capabilities of this particular setup are. But before I start, let me just make sure and see if there's any questions. And everybody's still there, right? Because I can't see any of you guys. Yeah, I think we're all still here. We're, we're down. Yeah, most everybody's still here. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, we're here. We're here. Okay, great. So I am going to, I'm going to mute myself. I'm now going to play this video. Uh, like I say, it's a little bit of a longer video, so uh, just bear with it, but it will walk you through the how, and I, and I guess the thing that impresses me about this is just with open source software, what you can actually achieve. I mean, even if you don't want to do really scientific stuff, but you want to see what an eclipsing by how the flux from an eclipsing binary, um, you know, comes through or any other variable star for that matter. Um, you know, with this relatively simple equipment, what you can achieve kind of surprised me. Um, and so um, hopefully it'll inspire you, even if you've got no real interest in in submitting work to AAVSO or, or, or whatever, um, but it's kind of a fun field to play around in. So anyway, here we go. I'm going to mute Having captured our raw data files, we can now move into photometric processing of these images. And the first thing to appreciate <clears throat> with respect to this is that we need a repeatable and proven processing methodology because this is absolutely critical to success. One of the things that I do to ensure that this happens is that I use a set file structure for each target. And this is now on display on the screen. I have three folders. I have my science images folder, a quarantine folder, and an AIJ process folder. In the science images folder, this contains all of the raw image data that was collected by SharpCap. And in this case, flats, darks and bias have already been applied. The quarantine folder is used to basically uh, put any images that we find are suspect and that should not go through the photometric processing process. And the AIJ process folder is where I do all of my processing and that's where my final output images will be stored. So the very first thing I do is I'll go into my science folder. I will select all of my images. I will copy those. I will then go into my process folder and I will paste all of those images into that folder. The images in the um, 
science folder I am not going to touch. Um, it's all too easy to corrupt data files through this process. So if you keep your science folder with unprocessed images, you can always go back. We're going to be using two tools for the processing. We're going to be using ASTAP and AIJ for the pre-processing. And then we're going to be using uh, AIJ for the actual differential photometry. And in order to make sure that I use a repeatable um, sequence of events to make sure that I do my photometry in exactly the same way each time, I actually take advantage of the sequencer in SharpCap. So I'll op the first thing I do is open SharpCap. And I'll open up my sequencer and select generate light curve. And this is going to be, walk me through all the steps necessary to process this data. And the very first thing it asked me to do is it asked me to do and install the daily update for AIJ. To do that, I go to help update Astro Image J. Okay. And typically, this downloads a couple of files which are installed and brings Astro Image J up to the current build. Okay, so I've done that. So I'll click OK. And now it's asked me to copy my raw images from the science folder to the AIJ processing folder. And as you saw, I already did that a few moments ago, so I can press OK. And then the next thing I need to do is inspect those images and remove any bad ones into the quarantine folder. So I'm going to do File, Import, Image Sequence. I'm going to go to my process files. I'm going to select the first file and it will now show me that I'm going to import 126 images. I'm going to go OK. Those images are now here. And this is the first image. And I am just going to quickly step through these images to make sure that they look OK. So it does not look like I need to quarantine them. Okay, great. So now I go back into SharpCap. Press OK. It asked me to close AIJ. So I will do that. And I've done that. So I'll press OK. And now it's going to ask me to do some pre-processing using the tool ASTAP. And the first of the pre-processing it wants me to do is do a batch plate sort. So I go into um, ASTAP, I do batch processing, batch sold images. I go to my data that I'm looking to process, which is here. This time I have to select all the images, so I'll just do Control A. Oops. I'll just do Control A. I'll open all of those images. And now immediately uh, ASTAP starts the plate solving process. And as you can see, it's actually plate solving each image in less than half a second. And these images just um, are for a star called V474CAM. Uh, this is a uh, eclipsing binary. In fact, it's a contact eclipsing binary that I've been looking at for a few weeks now. And this is about the last of the data runs I need in order to um, get a full phase plot. So I go back into SharpCap. My plate solve is complete. I press OK. And it now asks me to bin the images in a 2 times 2 bin. So back into ASTAP, batch processing, batch convert. And I am now going to select all of my images again. So Control A. And immediately the uh, program starts doing a two times two binning. So basically, I'm reducing the file size from 3008 by 3008, which is the, um, the um, resolution of my camera, and I'm reducing that down to 1504 by 1504 by doing a 2 times 2 bin. 
This has the advantages of um, making sure that I've got a more appropriate um, arc second per pixel setting for my uh, photometric analysis. Um, and it's also got the nice benefit that it obviously reduces the file size. So I've now completed that. So I will go back into Cap, press OK. And now it's going to ask me to uh, delete the uh, unbinned images and everything so that I can save hard drives. Um, so I've deleted my un unbinned images. I press OK. And I'm now being asked to import those into AIJ. So I'm going to do import image sequence. Here are my images. And again, I only need to pick the first one because AIJ will then pick up all the, the remainder of the images uh, because they're in the same format. So again, it's going to import 126 files for us. And I've got those in there. So back to SharpCap, so I can press OK. And now it's basically going to ask me to do um, a line using WCS. And this is important because my apertures um, are going to be placed. And if the underlying image is moving, um, because we haven't done an alignment to the world coordinate system, uh, the apertures will slide off the star. And of course, I will then get incorrect measurements. So I'm going to do this align alignment process. So I go back into AIJ. And I need to go to actually probably the other window. And I need to do um, process align stack using WCS. And the important thing to have clicked here is use RA and DEC to do the alignment. Press OK. And you'll now see it stepping through. And it's basically aligning all of those 100 and 26 images so that I can place my apertures and the stars will stay in the same place. And that has created a, another uh, subdirectory called uh, uh, that's got the aligned images in. So it's just alerting me to that fact. So I go back into Shark Cap. So I've done that process. And now it's going to ask me to import the aligned data into AIJ. Now it's going to say um, select. And basically, it's going to ask me now to use the data processor uh, to go ahead and place the apertures for the photometric analysis. So I go back into AIJ. Um, I've imported my images, so I'm going to go data process. Uh, and it's going to, first of all, give me the DP coordinate converter. The important thing here is just to make sure that my geographic location of my observatory is set correct, which it is. So I can exit the coordinate converter. Now I need to select my images for um, that I'm going to use for photometric uh, process, and I select that. Then I click here, and it will show me the files that are here. So I click on the first one, and that's brought the first image in. So now I need to put in a wild card. As soon as I put in that world card on the count, now it sees all 126 images. So I'm ready to start the processing. Now, if you were doing adding your dark frames, flat frames, and bias, um, you can do it here. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've already done that. So I don't need to do it here. So I can skip past this part. I will set my. Um, image uh, to 32-bit so that I get the maximum resolution uh, The uh, as we so, um, go through the photometric process. Uh, it, all of the information is going to be uh, stored in another subfolder called pipeline out. And I am going to basically now initiate my um, photometric process. So I click start. And what it's now going to do is it's going to ask me to place my apertures for my target and comparison stars. Um, the first thing you need to do before you do this is to make sure that your aperture radiuses are correct. And these are correct. Um, I've already uh, used these on previous image files, so I know these are correct. I'm going to place my apertures according to the RA and deck position. Um, and I need to have these couple of checkboxes checked. 
So I'm now going to place apertures. And here is my image that I am I'm going to place my apertures in. And I am going to place these apertures in a specific order. So um, I'm going to click on this one first. This is going to become my target star, which is uh, V4745. Now I'm going to click my reference stars, my comparison stars, sorry. And these are going to be C2, which is this one here. C3, which is this one here. And I'm going to go C4, C5, C6, C7, and C8. And these reference stars or comparison stars have been identified either using the uh, tools within AAVSO or if reference stars have been picked in previous observ observations um, and documented, you can use that. And I've added some randomly picked um, comp stars on a similar magnitude, um, similar star magnitude to my target star. So I've picked my uh, target stars and my comp stars. And now once I've done that, I can press return and it will start the photometric processing. Okay, so we've now processed our 126 images and we've create, we've got this measurements file, which I will actually go and save. And I will save that. Uh, I've got to get that in the right place. So I'm going to save it right here. So I've now saved that particular file and I'm going to go back into SharpCap. Um, and I've done this so I can press OK. I've run my data through the data processor so I can press OK. And now I can plot the data if the data processor has not initiated a plot, which in my case it hasn't. So what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to go back into AIJ and I am going to go and I'm going to click on this. And this will bring up my plot function. And I am going to plot two things. I'm going to plot the relative flux of T1. And I am going to plot the relative flux of the comp star C3. And I know from previous analysis that this is the best comp star. And obviously, T1 is my target star. And it's actually plotted that curve, albeit it hasn't brought it up on the screen. So I'm going to go and just grab that window and drag it over here. And you can see here that we have um, the measurements that I've collected. And actually, this is in a phase plot format at the moment. So I'm just going to go into my, my multi-plot window here, and I'm going to do unphase. And I'm going to go back into my plot. There we go. So now you can see the data that I collected over my measurement period. The relative flux of my target is falling away. The relative flux of my comp star is uh, relatively flat, which is what you ideally want to see. And this is one part of the overall light curve of uh, the four. Uh, V474 cam. Okay, so we've done that. So one final thing I'm going to do here now is I'm going to close this down because um, we've done the processing on, on this. But let me just check into SharpCap and see if there's anything else. So I've done my plot. Um, I need to save a PNG of the target and comp star positions. I've already done that in a previous exercise. I've saved my measurement data. I don't want to save my measurement plot in this case uh, because I'm actually going to take this data now and combine it with the data that I've used previously and press OK. Is I'm going to go back into my measurements file that I just created for this piece of data. And I'm going to select this data. And as you can see, uh, the program creates a huge amount of data. Uh, most of it you don't actually use, and you can limit the amount of data that is actually physically generated. Um, I am going to copy this information, go 
done that. And I'm now going to go back into my my measurement spreadsheet, which is here. And this contains all of the measurements that I've taken over a whole series of evenings. And I'm going to go to the bottom of that. And I'm going to cut and paste in this final set of measurements. And I'm going to save that. And now I'm going to go back into uh, AIJ. I'm going to open the combined measurements plot or uh, combined measurements Excel file. which is this huge file here. I'm now going to go into my plot again. And I am going to look at relative flux and uh, T1 and C3. And the first plot that's come up is it's showing you basically, this is uh, time orientated on the x-axis across here. So it's showing you the various nights that I've taken measurements. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to go into my main, multi-plot main. I'm going to do phase. I'm going to redraw. And this is my completed light curve for the contact eclipsing binary V0474CAM. As you can see, I've got a really quite pleasing shape here that I can determine a lot of information from. Okay, uh, hopefully you stuck with the video there and uh, uh, we went through. And just before I move away from the video, uh, let me just say that the uh, peak to trough variation is 0 0.5 of a magnitude. Um, it goes from about 11 to 11.5. Um, so you can see here that my resolution um, that I've got from this equipment is actually pretty, pretty staggering, really. Um, I can get down to 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.01 of a magnitude or something like that without any problem at all. Certainly enough <clears throat> uh, resolution and accuracy uh, to do an exoplanet transit, which uh, is typically a one or two percent variation in uh, relative flux coming from from the star. Okay, so let me just finish off now with a few slides. Having captured our war dates. There we go. Um, so uh, let me just uh, finish off with a few slides. Um, I've mentioned Exoplanet Watch a couple of times. Um, this is a citizen science project. Um, aimed at looking at um, exoplanet transits. It's going to be kicking off in June of this year. So um, those of us that are currently involved with the project are uh, working uh, either with the tool that they're hoping, well, they will be using, it's called Exotic, or they're um, providing feedback on the website or um, the narrative for the Citizen Science Project, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, what we're doing here is we're taking some of the targets that have been identified by TESS as potential targets. I mentioned TESS a little bit earlier. Um, looking at the exoplanet transits and coming up with the critical timing uh, parameters, which is basically when a transit starts and when it stops and the duration of that transit and determining when the next transit is going to occur. Um, so that when the big telescopes uh, swing on to one of these targets, they know exactly what time to look at the target and they're not wasting valuable telescope time. Um, the data that is uh, being collected is uh, available to the community um, through this effort. Um, and observers, uh, those of us that are um, um, doing some of the citizen science work, any of the results that are used uh, within published paper, papers, then those observers are credited and it's all part of uh, NASA's uh, universe of learning. 
So as I mentioned, the official launch is uh, the summer of 2000, uh, well, this summer, 2021. I think we're on target for that. If anybody is interested, uh, there's a number of ways of going about it. One way is to contact the Exoplanet Watch directly at JPL. Um, probably the best way of going about it is to reach out to Pat Boyce, uh, since Pat is heavily involved in this project. And if you want to learn more about the project, you can just go to their website, which is exoplanets.nasa.gov, exoplanet-watch. And anybody can participate in the JPL Exoplanet Program meetings, which take place uh, every second Wednesday. Um, and in fact, I was one of a number of people um, on the program meeting this morning. Um, and this is the exotic user experience, uh, what we're trying to finalize now for um, these exoplanet transits. And it basically is a five-step process. We want to get people to uh, plan their observing session, to actually physically do the observing with anything down to as small as a three-inch telescope. Um, and then use either exotic, which is a dedicated tool, or Astro Image J, uh, which is also a dedicated tool that was developed around exoplanets. Um, and in fact, it was Astro Image J that you were looking at uh, for the analysis of the eclipsing variable there. You could use one of these two methods to do the processing. Um, the idea of the exotic platform um, running on Google Colabs is to make the experience for the end user completely seamless so that you can basically um, bring your data to the table, run through a very guided procedure for analyzing that data and all the results are produced in the right format. If you do it with Astro Image J, there's a lot more hands-on work and you could probably get an idea the amount of hands-on work and it's even more complicated uh, just from going through the work on the eclipsing binary that you saw in the video there. And then once you've got your results, you would upload those to the AAVSO website and they then make them um, the transition, that data then goes on to JPL. And as I said, um, any of the data that's used um, in a published pa paper, um, those people get credit for along with the uh, co-authors of the particular paper. Um, and it's a big citizen science project that we're all trying to uh, bring to fruition uh, with the hope of um, going through a lot of these exoplanets of which there's far more data than there is people to process it at the moment. Um, and do that. And then the other thing, as I mentioned, is um, I really want to bring uh, this year to SDAA uh, the ability to do some public outreach around either an exoplanet transit um, or a um, uh, or a clip or and eclipsing binary. Um, and so, oh, and that was the youngest member of the SDAA to pop in there and then immediately run away. She's obviously left me some present here. Um, but like I say, um, there are some great outreach opportunities here. And I think it would be, um, you know, very cool uh, to be able to uh, show people in real time um, that things are varying in the night sky that we really don't appreciate. Um, and what the mag what the significance of that particular information is. So that's kind of one of my goals for this year is to is to do a couple of outreach events around around that. Um, and so the photometric success this year is it's been, um, you know, I've been able to significantly broaden my interest in, in the hobby, which I think, you know, we're all trying to achieve at some point is to is to stretch ourselves a little bit. Um, I've already undertaken a number of um, measure, precision measurements on a couple of different variable stars. I've also been looking at some HADs um, and some um, uh, R-Liker stars as well. Uh, those are around the sort of eight day period. The HADs are actually several hour period. Um, and I think um, many of us have going through the, the Boys Astro program are now well on our way to becoming citizen scientists. And it's been real fun to um, be part of the Exoplanet program. Um, you know, um, many of us are retired and it's kind of cool to be participating in real meetings, talking to people about real science. I did a PhD in satellite communications 30 or 35 years ago. Um, and it's actually kind of cool to be 
uh, talking with people that are doing this for a living um, and be taken seriously. Um, so uh, that to me has been great this year. And as I mentioned, I'm also working with a pretty really sharp guy at the A AVSO. Okay, so I'm happy now to take any questions if you have them. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it and hopefully I, I'm going to stop my screen share and uh, so that I can actually see everybody again. Okay. Gary, I got to say that was great. That was quite a uh, exhibition of, of, of things that we uh, all I think are interested in. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there. <laughs> I have questions that I that are that are so there's so many questions I just can't um, put them all together in a short length of time. So why don't I? Why don't we have uh, everybody else uh, uh, present their questions? And uh, we've got another 15, 20 minutes. So uh, maybe not quite that much, but no, nobody's going to turn us off. So let's just. Take whatever questions arise. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to uh, try and answer any questions. I, I'm I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm certainly uh, happy to uh, happy to answer anything I can. What kind of bandwidth do you usually use on your live events, as far as uplink and downlink? Um, so I'm kind of lucky at the house. Uh, I have uh, spectrum and um, I've got like 10 or 15 uh, up and uh, probably 100 plus down. So I'm not uh, bandwidth limited here. But we've actually been having really good luck. Uh, Dave brings along a MiFi unit, which I think is on the Verizon uh, network. And we've been able to use that without any problems at all. So we're using um, LTE. Um, for that, um, and you can get some pretty good bandwidths on on LTE. So, uh, yeah, I think anybody that's using a, either a sort of MiFi like device or that um, you know as as a reasonably decent internet. And when I say reasonably decent, anything around sort of maybe ten and five or would be sufficient. You can and you and you can always dial back the uh, video stream a little bit if you if you run into bandwidth problems. Yeah, uh, one more comment on that. Um, I've taken that MiFi unit and checked a couple of local places. Um, Oak Oasis, it uh, turns out they have a, uh, a cell tower just off their property. And it's actually a fantastic connection there, uh, good bandwidth, and it's worked very well. Uh, one other popular place I know most of you know about would be up on uh, Sunrise Highway uh, at the uh, gravel pit area up there looking over Pine Valley. Believe it or not, there's very good uh, connection up and down at that location. So we must have a pretty good connection to the, one of the cell towers along I-8. And I know uh, Gary and I haven't been there doing any, any uh, production stuff there, but I was up testing it and it's actually uh, actually very good. And I don't know if Woody is still on the stream. Well, I see, I see you are. Uh, I know Woody was thinking about uh, doing some testing out of TDS to see if we had um, uh, some kind of a decent service up there. I'm not sure how that's gone, but anyway, yeah, that it works pretty well as long as you have a pretty good connection. We can we can live stream off a just a standard router. Uh, I haven't tried streaming it off my phone. Uh, the downlink works were pretty good, but I don't know how the uplink would. That was more along my question is, <clears throat> do you guys know what you require as far as up and uh, uplink and downlink band bandwidth speeds in order to maintain 720 uh, through LTE? Yeah, you um, at a minimum, you're looking at about three, uh, three megabits a second. In both directions, bi-directional or? Uh, in the uplink. OK, um, yeah, that's not much. But as soon as you start getting getting uh, a little bit clever it, it it gets more difficult so like we've done one live stream where dave uh came in on a skype channel so we needed more there because um dave's skype is coming into me 
I'm live streaming out to YouTube because the YouTube stream is delayed from real time. I have to Skype my desktop back to Dave so that he can comment in real time as opposed to comment on the stream, which is 15 seconds delayed. So under those circumstances, you're going to need uh, at least double or triple the bandwidth. So it kind of depends on what you're doing. Cool. Thanks. So I got one, Gary. The the uh, photometry you're doing, you're using the same camera as you're using for the streaming, right? Yes. And it's a color camera. Yes, it's a color of CMOS camera. Right. Now that uh, I think that would uh, for the exotic for uh, Rob Stellum's stuff in exotic, I think that probably works pretty well, but. Uh, have you thought about the impact of the color on the photometry? Yeah, so that's that's a, a good question. Um, I think for exotic, it's fine. Um, if you if you really want to get into the deeper science and start doing, um, uh, I guess slightly better. Well, definitely more precision measurements than a mono camera with filters is the way to go. Um, but that being said, you know, it kind of depends on what your goals are. I mean, my I try and tell a story to people um, and I try and to encourage them to get into an area at as minimum cost as possible. Because if you suddenly say, well, you've got to spend five grand on equipment, that immediately puts a load of people off. Um, but if you can demonstrate that you can do a lot of the work with you know, what you've already got to hand, that's fine. And if you then want to take that one step further, um, then you can either spend, you know, spend some additional money. Now, I will say, looking at the AAVSO website, they are clearly beginning to recognize that CMOS cameras now are the thing that people are going to be using. And you can actually now tag the fact that you're using either the green channel, the blue channel, or the red channel from your camera, for instance in one of their uploads and they're taking that as an upload as opposed to a specifically filtered image. So um, I don't know the precise degradation that you see in the photometric data that you're getting. Um, for some things, it probably doesn't matter, such as perhaps timing, but for perhaps right. absolute magnitude measurements, then clearly it would matter a little bit, but it, yeah. it depends on your application. Yeah, I think for tests, you know, tests actually in their uh, in their target list, they specify the filter that they're interested in in having you use. And so, for that, for for uh, verifying test targets, it's it's a problem. But I think uh, exotic and and probably a lot of the of the double star or the uh, eclipsing binaries and other uh, interesting variables, it isn't so such a big deal. And I, and I think the thing that really blew me away with, with this was just what you can achieve with a basic C8. I mean, you know, I would have never have thought that I could see this level of precision with relatively cheap off the shelf equipment that a lot of people have got to hand. Right. Um, yeah. And so that, that was the thing that sort of really blew me away was the fact that I can now actually do science like projects. Um, yeah. Uh, in my backyard um, and see some things that I'd never thought that I could see unless I had a professional setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else got questions? I know that the, the EAA subject uh, is uh, putting the software together. I understand that we probably have hardware that's uh, suitable for doing it, but putting the soft whether putting the software together the way you have done is is uh, quite an undertaking. Do you have any recommendations as to how one should proceed from you know being just uh, just uh, astrophotographers to 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 actually streaming this stuff? I mean. Yeah, I, I, there are a number of really good resources out there. Uh, there's a 
quite a number of us who are putting videos together on the sort of overall process and stuff like that. The Cloudy Nights EAA forum is a really good place to um, participate. Um, several, there's at least two um, uh, written guides that have been put, put together um, that are available through that forum. Uh, one of them actually from one of our own members who is, um, I only know his first name, is Hitan. He's down in Sabre Springs. He runs, um, he's got, got an observatory down there. Does some really nice astro imaging with uh, uh, Raz, Raza. Um, and, but he's put together an EAA guide. Um, and I think between those two things, and it will get you off the ground. And, and really, the software is not that complicated. I mean, at the end of the day, most of it is sharp cap. There's mount control, which you're already, you know, doing in some shape or form. I mean, I think you can use Nina, for instance, which is an astrophotography tool that a lot of people use. And you can use that for uh, doing live stacking and uh, EAA if you wanted to. Um, but I think SharpCap has just probably been targeted a little more at the EAA application, and and it's a you know a, it's a free tool. It's it's essentially a free tool, and uh, a very powerful tool. Um, but mm. the rest, there, there really isn't that much. I mean, no different from Astro, right? I mean, you you need ASCOM drivers, you need a mount controller, you need a image capture thing. I mean, the difference is that my image capture program does some processing, whereas you you normally do it with that in post in Pixel Insight or something like that. Yeah, very good. Got any more questions? Well, it turns out it's almost exactly nine o'clock. So you, you did a good job of killing two hours, Gary. Well, you just say one to two hours. So yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Yeah. Right. laughs> well, this I, is, this is to me, it's been very informative and uh, in, in what you did in, in photometry is, uh, you know, I'm involved in the same, same thing. Right. And uh, your approach is a little bit different than mine, but I certainly recognize what you're doing and why you're doing it. And uh, uh, photometry, I think, is a, is a real good way to expand beyond just pictures. Uh, yeah. And, and it was interesting. When I spoke to my mentor, who's a guy called Kevin Alton, I believe his name is. Um, and he's, po so. sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. And he has written a lot of I mean, his website is just full of papers that he's written. He's really into the science of this stuff. And yeah. I said to Kevin, I said, look, you know, my interest is, you know, I want to tell a story. I want to get people interested. I, you know, I'm not really interested in the deep science of this so much, I, but I want to be able to demonstrate that the average person can go out and look at an eclipsing binary and pull out the important criteria around that star and understand that things are changing and moving and doing things up there it's not just static and yeah. he was he was you know he was really good he was like yeah fine I understand where you're coming from and so our relationship I think is different, is different than it would be between him and his average people that he's mentoring because you know I'm trying to do a different thing with it yeah great any anybody else got other questions then I think this has been a great meeting and uh, thank you very much, Gary.